Hello, everybody. My name is Richard Benjamins, and I'm the Chief AI and Data Strategist at Telefonica. It's a pleasure and honor for me to be here with you and share with you our experiences with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence today is being used everywhere in many different businesses across societies and our economies. It is so, it is so big and it's becoming massively used that it's not only uh, sufficient to think about business value, but we also have to think about society, about ethics and about its impact, its potential impact in climate change. Yeah? That's what I'm going to talk uh, about today. First, let, let's start with the business part, which is what we all uh, very know, know very well, and it's about how can help AI in the different uh, companies to improve their functioning. Now, there are many studies that explain that in the future, uh, this will be a huge economic opportunity. Yeah? PwC estimated by 2030, almost $16 trillion uh, as to, uh, to add to the GDPs across the world. Yeah? And this would happen through the use of AI in different applications. Yeah? Think about digital assistants or chatbots, uh, optimization of all kinds of uh, processes in companies and in industry, analysis of fraud, uh, better understanding of the market, marketing, call center, HR, you name it. Any single business process can be improved with this kind of technology. And it's not only in one sector. Yeah? It's in the insurance, software, telecoms, retail. Many different sectors um, are using this. And increasingly, more sectors will use it in more intensive way. So there is a huge business opportunity in general. But what does this mean for an individual company? Now, let's, uh, let's have a look at what Telefonica is doing in artificial intelligence. It's an example of uh, a company in, the, in a certain sector, telecommunication sector, how it improves uh, the business and even creates new business. Yeah? So um, there are different areas, uh, let's say three areas. I will, I will discuss each of them in the following slides. And the first is about using it internally to optimize our business. Yeah? So we do a lot of work in understanding our customer life cycle. How do we manage value? Yeah? Uh, how do we price our products? We use artificial intelligence and data to look around us to, to maybe have uh, certain segments have different prices in an intelligent way. We, pre we predict what customers might leave and then we try to retain them. But we also apply it to our marketing areas. To and we try to improve our marketing campaign so that we get a better uh, a better conversion or a better rate. We do that with, for instance, uh, recommending devices to our customers uh, based on the type of usage they make, uh, the, the type of contract they have, and, and also their, their history. Uh, we also do this in the B2B market. Uh, we do recommendation of, of uh, video. So a lot of things about uh, providing our customers what, what they need. And then there is the optimization of our core business. Of course, we deploy uh, mobile and fixed networks, fiber, uh, 4G, 5G. We invest a huge amount of billions yeah, uh, in these uh, deployments. And if we can optimize the deployment just a little a bit, a small percentage, that means already a huge amount of, uh, of money. So we apply it across our core business in those three different ways. And here I've listed a few use cases, but there can be tens or hundreds of use cases across the business. Yeah? We also use it in our relation with the customer. So we try to innovate in relation using, in this case, digital assistance technology, voice recognition, such that our customers can have an individual conversation uh, with the systems without having uh, an agent yeah, uh, in between. I will show you four brief examples. It's the same technology. Uh, it's used in the same way, but it's deployed in different countries and geographies and in different businesses. The first one is in Telefonica in Spain, where we have a digital assistant where, you, where customers can interact through voice and cognitive services with their TV. Let's have a look. Quiero ver Vengadores Infinity War en la televisión. Ponga ello, dame un segundo. So here a customer asks for a certain uh, movie uh, that he or she wants to see 
and it, uh, it talks to the mobile phone and then it pops up at the TV so the customer can uh, look at it. Yeah? Secondly, we also have, and this is in the UK, an interaction with uh, customers where they can ask about their contract. So here is an example where customers can inquire about the differences in uh, a bill on a monthly basis. Why my bill is higher? Let's have a look. Your latest bill was 50 pence higher than usual because of extra charge. So here the system uh, understands the question. It goes into the systems in the IT system to retrieve the specific customer information and uh, returns it back to the customer. We also have uh, video conferencing where we have actually a device in the customer homes, which we call Movistar Home, where you can actually do video conferences over the TV and the, and the device. Haz una videollamada a Alejandro. Ah, ¿qué tal? So all uh, through interaction by voice, yeah? So this is very co consumer oriented and the, the same technology we also put in a call center and this is in Brazil uh, where, uh, where, where customers can call and about let's say 30% of the inquiries can be handled by this digital assistant and of this 30%, about 70% can be uh, dealt with on, on the first uh, interaction. A brief Olá. example. Nós vamos continuar o seu atendimento por aqui. Como eu posso te ajudar? Eu queria saber qual é a promoção que eu tô. So vendo. this is in Portuguese in Brazil, so I won't uh, I won't play it all the way. But the important thing here is that this is the same technology. It's the same assistant, which can be deployed quickly across different applications and different geographies, which is quite an uh, an achievement uh, because of all the uh, heterogeneity in in data sets that are below it. Now, we talked about optimization of the core business. We talked about the customer relation, innovation in the customer relation, but we also have what we call big data products. Yeah? So this is products that are built on top of uh, our, uh, our network data. This is mobility data. It's created based on aggregation and anonymization of the customer data, the localization data. Now, every handset is connected to antennas and when handsets, mobile devices move around, that is captured, as you all know, and we anonym anonymize and aggregate the data and we create insights. What you see on the left-hand side is Barcelona. Uh, it's uh, movements on a certain day from everywhere in the city to three specific areas, the hospital, the harbor, and the university. Yeah? And what you can see is how many movements there are throughout the day through those specific uh, areas. And this is very helpful for, for instance, planning the public transport system. Yeah? Instead of having in the past, uh, people standing at the entry of the metros asking, where are you going? Is this for leisure or for work? Uh, instead of doing this 30,000 times during three days and spending several millions of euros, this is much more precise, much more economic. You can do it whenever you want, taking into account uh, season effects like Christmas, like summer holiday. Uh, so it really is uh, an improvement on the way uh, public transportation can be planned. The same data can be used for many other things. Yeah? On the right hand side, you have a festival, an application in tourism, um, where there's a festival in Valencia in Spain. And here you can see from which areas in Spain people are coming. Uh, you can also even see it from uh, which international countries uh, visitors are coming. And this is all roaming information as, as internationally concerned. But you can also see during the, in the city itself, during a normal day or during a day of the festival about mobility patterns of the of the people. And this can help the organization and even the police of the city, local police to optimize safety aspects and security aspects of the, of the event. Yeah? So these are uh, products that actually created a new business for uh, Telefonica because in the past we didn't have this kind of business, but now we, we, we are in, engaging with all kinds of sector, transport sector, logistic, retail sector, for, uh, for those kinds of products. Now, <clears throat> it's not uh, easy how to get there, yeah? So we use AI and big data across our businesses, uh, but the, the let's say the journey to get there is not an easy journey. We started actually in 2011 or 2012 with a statement that data is not an exhaust of our operation, data is a strategic asset. Yeah? And then we started the journey where we first explored 
use cases, can this work for us? What would be the impact? Once we understood that, we decided to transform, which means at the global, from a global perspective, perspective, coordinate what we are doing across the board, have use cases identified that are important across the group, uh, have a roadmap, also think about data collection, what data should be collected and whatnot. And this was a very tough phase. Yeah? Um, and once we get, got through that phase, we were able to take important decisions based on data. Yeah? Uh, in addition to, of course, expertise, intuition and experience. Um, and the last phase, once you have all the data in place at the, a at the scalable way, you can actually apply artificial intelligence and think about cognitive services, uh, external monetization, uh, what we saw, yeah, customer interaction. Things that are becoming very important if you work at that scale is, of course, privacy and uh, ethics of the data, yeah, because there are also impacts of this data, what we see later. Anyway, it is a complex journey, and actually, we uh, we we went through that journey. We made many mistakes. We stepped back. We we reflected, and we took different decisions. Yeah? Um, now, in order for other companies to learn from that, I actually wrote all these experiences up in a book, um, which is called "The Data Driven Company: Twenty One Lessons for Large Organizations to Create Value from Artificial Intelligence," which classifies the challenges or the decisions that company need to make in five categories organizational, so where do you put the chief data officer, what is the relation with IT, uh, business part, where do you start, how do you select use cases, how do you measure the economic impact, uh, how do you finance this whole uh, story and the journey. On the technological part, is it cloud or on-premise, uh, how do you, where do you run the analytics, is it central, is it local, data collection strategy, and of course, also people, yeah? So people that have to do it. And finally, also important, responsibility. It's not about only about profit, it's also be, being about uh, being a responsible organization in society, yeah? Okay, so far uh, about how we are using AI in our business um, and what we've learned from that, yeah? Now, I'm gonna stay, uh, start with the second part, which is using the same technology, not so much for commercial benefit, but for societal benefits. I call, call it AI for good. Um, AI for good, we associate that with helping achieve or monitoring the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. We all know these are the big problems that we have in the world, climate change, inequality, uh, health, water, education. And it is true that even though those goals are uh, very close already, we're already in 20, almost in 2023, it's very hard to measure uh, uh, the progress on those goals because many of the KPIs that are defined cannot be measured at the moment because there is no data available or they don't know how to measure. So this is where uh, big data and AI also can help. Um, you can uh, imagine this as... Uh, if you look on the right hand side, this is a Mexico City. It is network activity uh, just before, during, and after an earthquake. Yeah? Now you see a lot of lights uh, shining up. This is activity. People in the network, people that are uh, suffering the earthquake, are contacting uh, the family friends saying, I'm all right or I'm not all right. That creates more activity and that is captured in the network. Now, this is in 2012. Luckily, it was not a very devastating earthquake but when we made this visualization in our research department already way back in 2012 suddenly we realized there is a lot of value in this data and with this for instance we could inform the mexican government about which areas would be more uh, affected by the earthquake yeah? you can you can uh, look at this as uh, Plato's cave, yeah, where uh, the prisoners had only could only look uh, at the shadow of reality, as you can see on the left hand side, and then they had to inter interpret or infer what would be reality actually be. Now, big data you can see as something like that. It's like a shadow of reality on the right, right hand side in the video. You see the sh shadow, and then in the context you interpret what it means in this case for a for an earthquake or a natural disaster. Now, this has been done in many places already. Uh, it has been shown that actually big data, 
from different companies, from a telecommunications company, from a financial institution, from an insurance company, or from a travel or an, an airline uh, organization, all that data is very relevant for helping move uh, forward with the sustainable development goals. And we will see a few examples. Yeah? Now, this big data as a reflection yeah, of reality, this is an example of uh, our network in Spain. Yeah? It's about almost 150,000 antennas almost 1 billion events a day yeah, with roaming and, and, and home customers, and more than 20 million customers. And uh, all this network generates this big data that we can abstract from and extract uh, insights from that we've seen uh, in, the, in the demos and in the videos. Yeah? Of course, this is all anonymized and aggregated data. It's not related to personal data at all. Yeah? <clears throat> Here an example for a flooding scene in Mexico in 2009. Uh, on the bottom side, you see at, uh, activity in the network. And on the top side with the circles, you see actually the, the flooding activity yeah, when the flooding is worse. And again, you see a very high correlation between intensity of this natural disaster and network activity, which again demonstrate that uh, the mobile network in an anonymized and aggregated way is the kind of a pulse, yeah, a monitor of human activity, which is very helpful for understanding natural disasters and yeah, how regions are affected by those disasters. Here's another example where we applied it to COVID, yeah, to pandemics. Uh, there was a joint initiative between the European Commission and 16 telco telecommunications operators in, in Europe, where those operators shared on a daily basis mobility data yeah, between two cities on this specific day, let's say 10,000 movements, yeah, and that between uh, different provinces within countries at the European level. And then the European Commission mixed that data with data of cases of COVID. And as you see on the right hand side, it's allowed for all kinds of analysis. Yeah? You see here on the, on the left hand side, you see the cases of COVID in Europe in a certain period. In the middle pane, you, you see a focus on Sardinia, which is a small island near Italy. And what you see on the right hand side is the inbound, the inward movements to Sicilia. Yeah? Now you see at the top, the, on the on the blue uh, bars, you see a very high top, and this is mobility data. And two weeks after, you see a, a small spike in the COVID cases. Yeah? So this tool allows that if there is a detection of inward bound uh, movements in a certain area, you might be at risk yeah, for a certain uh, COVID uh, peak, which allows uh, governments to be prepared for when this peak actually happens. Yeah? So there were all kinds of use cases around, uh, around this data uh, with mobility in cases, and it was used by the European Center of Disease Control and several European countries uh, to manage the, the crisis at the European level and also to learn from other uh, countries. Here you see another example where we covered where actually it's not only mobility data, it's also data of uh, financial institutions and it's data about energy consumption. And here three highlights that you can see is just before, uh, just before the confinement in, 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 in March, mid-March, there is a peak in uh, spending and that is everybody going to the supermarket and buying toilet paper and pasta, yeah, which was very uh, typical here in, in Spain. Here you see a, a valley in the um, in the uh, energy consumption, and that's because of the the Spanish government shut down for two weeks the non-essential economy. So all restaurants, all shops were closed unless it was necessary for the for for society. Yeah. Uh, and here you see also that the mobility within a province uh, actually <clears throat> slowly got back, but never got back. And that's because of teleworking for homeworking and also schools were closed and were given online. So here's an example that uh, policy, uh, government policies, decision makings is reflected in privately held data. And is actually a good monitor for understanding what is happening with, with the crisis. Yeah. Another example of AI for good is about air quality. Here is an example where we combined a lot of open data 
about the weather, about fixed AI uh, air quality stations, vegetation, uh, function of buildings, uh, census data about social demographics. We we combined it with the same mobility data that we've seen before, but also with mobile sensing, a mobile center on top of a car that drives through cities. And this allowed us to uh, kind of build a map uh, something like a traffic map or Google Google Maps, where red is bad quality in the street, green is good quality, and orange is medium quality. We overlaid it with buildings. In this case, you see schools, and of course, you don't want uh, high quality of high uh, high pollution next to a school uh, during uh, the morning break eh, around eleven o'clock in the morning. So all those insights can help governments to better take and manage the air quality and also to take uh, more fine grade uh, decisions. So we've seen the business of, a, of AI. We've seen also AI that can be used to help improve societies uh, and the planet. Now we're going to speak about that this has to be done in an ethical way. Yeah. So it's, it's AI for some things, for business and for good, but then also you have to you do it in the right way. Yeah. And why you have to do it in the right way? Because we all know those examples yeah, of, uh, of AI working very well, but then making some mistakes that are undesired. Yeah? So on the left-hand side, you see this camera, uh, there is a rectangle around every face, except for one face, and that happened to be a color face. Yeah? Now, we know all why this is the case, because this uh, machine, this camera, was not trained with sufficiently diverse images of people, mostly, uh, let's say, white people and not diverse people. And of course, the camera has no notion about uh, people or whatever, or color. It just learns what it sees. Yeah. So this is something that can be avoided uh, if you think about it in advance. Yeah? The same with translation, automatic translation. We all know, uh, if you ask uh, Google, that all doctors are male and all uh, nurses are female. And if the system doesn't have any other context, uh, then it always translates a nurse as female and a doctor as male. Those are things that actually are discriminating against gender. Uh, Google is currently intervening in the algorithm. So if you now ask to translate uh, uh, a nurse, then it gives in Spanish the two different options, female and, uh, and, and male, but that's still not part of the machine learning algorithm. So there are all kinds of, uh, this is all about the bias problem. There are issues about uh, jobs. There are issues about explainability. If you use a very complex algorithm, how do you explain that? And so what can you do about this? Yeah? This is where the ethical use of AI comes into place. There are many organizations that try to work on this to avoid that. The European Commission has guidelines for trustworthy AI. UNESCO has recommendations for AI. The OECD has recommendations for uh, ethical AI. So many, many uh, organizations are. Singapore is very, very, uh, very advanced on this as well. And so also Telefonic in 2018, based on its massive uh, plan to massively use this technology, issued AI principles that we have to abide to. Yeah? AI should be fair, should be transparent and explainable, should be human-centric with privacy and security. And also if we work with third parties, uh, they should also respect those privacies. Yeah? We have a kind of governance model where we, uh, yeah, we define how this happens on a daily basis. We train our employees. We have a questionnaire where we ask the right questions. We have new roles like a responsible AI champion. And if, if there are problems, we have an escalation process yeah, to sort out the difficulties. We are currently uh, fully in the process of implementing this across the company. What we want to do for every product that we launch into the market, do a kind of analysis. First, the risk analysis, and then an analysis of how the ethical principles are affected by this specific uh, specific product. Yeah? The risk analysis we do on three dimensions, the severity of something goes wrong, the scale, so how many people are affected, and third, the likelihood that it happens. Yeah? And those things give a uh, score, and we combine that in the end in a kind of score that helps us uh, understand in general how we are doing with respect to ethical principles. This is not only relevant because we think it's important, it is also important because the, uh, there is an upcoming European AI regulation, not for all AI systems, but for high-risk AI systems in certain areas. Uh, and those will have to comply with strict obligations yeah, that to some extent resemble what we are doing with, with our approach, but they are even uh, stricter and more uh, complicated. 
Now, that was the, uh, the ethical part of AI. So you have to use AI. You can use it for business. You can use it for good. But if you use it, you have to make sure that you are aware of potential unintended negative consequences. And actually, you can manage those using such a methodology as I presented. We use that methodology, uh, responsible AI, by design. So you don't launch a product and then you think about the things, but in every process, in the conception of the process, in the development and the design, even if you buy it from a third party, in all that process, there is a thinking about what could go wrong. Yeah? Is my data biased? Uh, what can I do about that? Yeah? Now, the last part is uh, yeah, more recent even, and it's called green AI. Yeah? And that's the case that so in general, uh, we know that ICT has a big impact on, on climate change. Yeah? So some estimated by 2030, 20% of all the emissions are not coming from cars or from factories, but actually are coming from ICT, from data centers, from all the computation power uh, that is going on in the world. And if you apply that to artificial intelligence, then there are a few big models that are, are, have, uh, are, cre are creating some uh, concerns around people. Because, uh, for instance, if you are aware of the large language models yeah, that are, and what I just said, automatic translation, these are huge models. Uh, and they, they can take like 10 months to be trained on all kinds of data. And they can spend like 10 million in, in energy, uh, in energy bill, so energy consumption. So the footprint is actually uh, very large of those models. Yeah. Um, there are some scientific articles that compare one training uh, session of such large models yeah, have the same carbon footprint as five cars during their whole life cycle. And that's a significant out amount of parts. So it's not always, uh, uh, it's not anymore uh, the larger, the better. Yeah? The larger also has a negative consequence, which you, of course, have to try to minimize. Yeah? And that's, so there's a current trend that speaks about uh, how can we improve those algorithms such that they uh, have a, a less carbon footprint. Yeah? And the first thing you have to do, of course, measure. So what uh, some research, uh, research institutes are doing, actually taking um, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, machine learning algorithms, and they measure. They open up the computer, as you can see on the right-hand side, they put all kinds of sensors, and they measure during the, what's happening with the code, what is the energy consumption, in order to learn what part of the code are, um, are generating more, uh, requiring more energy, and, and which part less, and, and then turn that into kind of a design uh, guidelines uh, for programming. So you don't program uh, in AI only for optimization to solve the problem, not for efficiency and speed, but also for less reduction in uh, less reduction in energy. Yeah? And all those three, uh, four things together for me is, is a kind of a an, an 360 perspective on artificial intelligence, because as I said, um, AI is going to be massively used across the, our different uh, businesses, across our societies, and only thinking about commercial uses is not enough anymore. Thank you very much.